Hello and welcome to the virtual session Software Defined Vehicles Need Software Defined Companies. My name is Günter Heling and I'm leading the product line Embedded Software and Systems within Vector, looking back at a history of more than 30 years in the area of automotive software development. Today I'd like to share with you my view on automotive software with a special focus on how organizations should adapt to current challenges like this one of software defined vehicles. Let's start with a closer look at the challenge automotive software. The significance of software regarding performance, reliability and character of a car will increase dramatically. And thus, that means for the automotive industry, OEMs and suppliers have to enforce their software engineering power. Now this statement is 20 years old, but it still holds true. But since then, the expectation, expectation regarding the amount of software has dramatically increased. So today we expect for 2030 as much as a value of 1 billion euro for the automotive software. In those days, you see it was only 100 billion dollar, uh, euro. So this is really a dramatic increase. And you need this amount of software to realize connected electrified vehicles that run automatically and can be shared. And there we will end up, 2030 is the expectation, to an amount of 300 million lines of code, which is more than double of what we have today. And when we look at an autonomous driving vehicle, we will end up with 1 billion lines of code. This is a lot, and you all know the buzzwords that are discussed in these days, like DevOps, like CI, CD, like microservices, like zonal architectures. And summing it up, we could say it's all about software, and we need software-defined vehicles based on a vehicle operating system developed in a software-defined organization. What is a software-defined vehicle? Let's compare it with a hardware-defined vehicle, which is in place today or in the past. There, the installed hardware defines and also limits the features and behavior of the vehicle. In con contrast to that, the software-defined vehicle sees a continuously updated software, and this updated software defines feature and behavior of the vehicle as far as the installed hardware supports it. And these leads us to requirements that go with this idea of software-defined vehicles. These three dimensions, in order to make this continuously updates possible and useful for the customer, you need to provide sufficient hardware headroom in order to allow lifetime updates. And you need to keep the hardware design stable to reduce software branches. Imagine you would update your hardware design each and every year, then you won't be able to deploy the same software to the different hardware variants, and then you will end up in a lot of branches, impossible to master them over time. And you need to ensure a high degree of verification, automation, and of virtualization in order to be able to prove the compliance with all the regulations for all these software updates, regulations regarding safety, security, and other legal stipulations. In the meantime, it's well accepted that a vehicle operating system is the basis of such a software-defined vehicle. And when we talk about operating system here, it is not comparable to the operating systems as we understand them in the software world, it's much more than that. It's an ecosystem that supports you to develop and to integrate user applications, and it consists of the runtime elements, the so-called base layer, and it consists of a software factory that supports you in developing and integrating the application functions into the base layer. So all in all, it's all about software and we're just at the beginning. So what we have today seem to be, seems to be challenging already, but what we will see in the future on a software perspective is much more than we have today and we will need much more and additional features or capabilities to cope with them. In order to be able to develop the software, you need to define the scope and the vision for your software endeavor. Let's have a look at the scope. The scope, or you could also call it the layers of automotive software, are depicted here, and it includes all the software needed for the in-vehicle experience. And this comprises software in-vehicle, 
Software for switches, software for HSMs, hardware security modules, software for microcontrollers, a lot of them in the vehicle, and the software for microprocessors, some of them in the vehicle. And it also comprises the software in the, in the cloud, here on the back end, in the back end, here on the right hand side. Looking at the different layers, we start with the application, which is really makes the in-vehicle experience. And of course, here you see the high competition relevance in many domains, taking one example, the automated driving, or another example, when it's about HMI, your inter way to interact with your driver. Second, system functions are needed to manage the in-vehicle software since many, many years. It's about diagnostics, but more comes on top, especially to link in the link with the cloud. It's about software update and it's about data collection. So you want to be able to collect data from the vehicle up to the cloud. And of course, you want to be able to download over the air a new software update into your vehicle. So this is partly competition relevant because it has some features. Maybe you want to differentiate from others, but it contains also some basic functionalities without competition relevance. Number three, basic software. This is the infrastructure for layer one and two. And here we're in the area where standardization is the key. We have a lot of standards. The most important one is Autosar. And it's clear here the competition relevance is really low. There's no big difference between one and the other. The board support goes down then to the hardware or it closes the link to the hardware. So it's a framework to integrate layer one to three. And here it's very clear there is the competition relevance very low. So if you decide as an OEM to enter into the field of automotive software to do more in the automotive software, you should have a close look to application and to system functions and not necessarily to basic software and board support. So looking at the scope or the layers is one aspect of software and the other is the competences that you need or the process elements that you want to support. And looking at the first part, it's on feature and component level. First to mention the software platform design, most important element from my point of view, because you need to have it very at the very beginning and you need a plan, a concept, how to want to derive your software platform. Your one software for all your variants. This needs really careful planning and uh, good support and methods and tools. Second, requirements, elicitation and formulation, well known to you. Behavior specification, also very well known, e.g. using uh, models to define the specification and then other elements, maybe a bit new architecture design for the software and then the implementation itself, static code, but please don't forget that you will need code generators or you should take benefit from using code generators. And at the end, of course, it's about verification. Then on system level, again, software platform design, same importance, same relevance as for the components and features. Architecture design, integration comes on top to the component view. And then again, it's verification and validation and then deployment to the different platforms you want to deploy it to. So these two aspects, scope or layers and competencies or process elements, you need to define based on these or with two, respect to these two aspects, what is your vision that you want to formulate and the, that you want to go for. And I'd like to give you one example, could sound like this, the OEM company XYZ is a software company until 2020 something having the ability to develop application software components for driver assistance and selected system functions on the highest level of safety and security and along the whole process chain. And having the ability to integrate the complete software at least for selected ECUs. This is just an example, but kind of this your vision should look like. Now summing up, identify which software you want to master to which extent and formulate a clear vision, easily understandable for all in your organization. But how to get there, how to do the transition, what do you need to be successful here? I'd like to share at the beginning a statement of Timo Kronen, partner with Berylis Strategy. And uh, I think it brings it really to the point what this story is about. 
Firms must adapt their processes, culture, and management practices to align the decentralized iterative and continuous evolution of the software-defined vehicle. So this tells you it's not only about technical aspects, it's also about processes, culture, and management practices. Let me go a bit into details, starting with the basics, what needs to come first. First, make sure that the top management understands the challenge and is willing to support it. Make clear to everybody, especially to the top management, software is not just another item to manage. Software is of a different nature. And patterns like try harder, work faster, won't work to push the transition. Number two, define a stepwise approach and a proper roadmap. You won't be able to do it in one step. Rather go for an evolution than a revolution and start with pilot projects that allow failures and delays. Number three, identify standards and existing software as a building block you want to use. Reuse is the key, otherwise you won't be able to develop this big amount of software. So you should concentrate yourself on the glue and on some differentiating features and in addition to that, use whatever is available on the market. And then it's important, identify partners to support your tour to the summit. You won't be able to do it alone. And please choose your car partner carefully. You will have to accept a certain level of dependence in binding to long-term partners, but it's worth it. And looking at the picture on the right-hand side, you will be in kind of this situation on your way to the summit. And in this situation, you don't want to change your partner. You want to stick to the partner and therefore, please, at the very beginning, select them very, very carefully. Number two, establish a software development organization. So you certainly need a powerful and empowered competent central software organization. And this organization will define methods like for agile development, applying the DevOps pattern for feature-based development, all these things. And it will be needed to define the appropriate processes for branching and merging, as already discussed, for safety, security, issue management, whatever is needed to develop the software. You will need this organization to define the appropriate tools, workflow management, configuration management, and continuous integration, continuous test, and continuous deployment. And this central organization is the one to cooperate with major software partners and it shall support the application areas. And then in the application areas, and this is number two, you will need also software competence. And this, these organizations in the application areas need, of course, to work together with the central organization and it needs a clear definition of work and competence split between central and local organization. In order to ensure this, number three, you need a frame organization linking both together. And this frame organization needs maximum management support in order to really yeah, define uh, the way to go. And your central organization must be close to and it must be accepted by the application areas. And number four, run a realistic hiring strategy. Take your time to grow. So having many software developers on board does not automatically mean that you are already a software company. Grow, growing means always it takes time until you get the right people, until the organization learns what is needed to be a software organization. This is much about organization. And the other element is you need a software development framework. You need something to help you to develop the software. Starting this with a definition of the overall workflow, you could call it a developer's journey. This should be based from our experience on a DevOps pattern. And please pay attention to the question, where do I need to be fast since I want or I need to change often? There you need high automation. Then select core tools. And uh, it's important to pay attention that these tools have proven excellence in large organizations. You won't be happy with a tool that is maybe able to work on a small project. You need it really for large organizations, large projects with hundreds and thousands of engineers working to it. And these tools should have defined and standardized interfaces or ex and support exchange formats. So you are able to allow extensions and integration 
of additional tools. Number three may sound a bit surprising. Align your processes to the tool capabilities. In former times, it was rather the idea of first I define the methods, then I define the processes, and based on that, I define, select, or develop my tools. But today, as the tools are so powerful and there are so many around, we have made the experience it makes a lot of sense in many cases to turn it around. Start with the tools, select the core tools as mentioned, and then align your processes according to the cool tool capabilities and ensure, of course, that the different tools that you're using are linked together in a, in a, in a good way. Maybe some additional glue code may be needed. Number four, make sure you are able to change your processes fast. Be agile and uh, listen to the DevOps idea, which says everything is code. And this means you don't define processes for a long, long period. You need to be able and everybody should be able to change processes in an easy way. So transition, make sure you have the right staff, also management, and define appropriate steps. Piloting is certainly essential. So far, I shared a lot of details with you. And now please let me close with two remarks I find so important to remember. First, understanding software needs time. An organization needs time to learn, so you will be able to pull the grass. Second, the real challenge is the maintenance of a software platform. And the effort to define and to run such a software platform is very often underestimated. You need a very good concept and you need a lot of power and focus to stick to that concept. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Software-defined vehicles need software-defined companies. I hope I could convey valuable information for you, how to define the appropriate scope and competencies for your way to a software-defined company and how you should plan your transition. Please don't forget, transition takes time and maintenance of a software platform is the key challenge. Now I'm looking forward to your questions and comments in the Q&A session. Thank you.